the Hoover Dam, one of America's most famous landmarks. Completed in 1935, it was the most colossal structure the modern world had ever seen. Not only was it the world's heaviest and tallest dam, it was also the largest producer of hydroelectric power. The Hoover Dam became an instant attraction and a monument to the sheer determination and courage of the 21,000 men who built it and the one man who made it happen. But today, more than 70 years later, the Hoover Dam is no longer the record-breaking superstructure it once was. The lessons learned building Hoover spawned a new generation of super dams. Dams that dared to be wider, taller, and even more powerful than their famous forerunner. Even so, the Hoover Dam can still lay claim to being the most famous, most iconic, and greatest dam ever built. And in the next hour, Megastructures will show you why. The Hoover Dam is a vast concrete edifice lying in the Mojave Desert, 30 miles southeast of Las Vegas. Straddling the border between Nevada and Arizona, it plugs the walls of Black Canyon holds back the mighty Colorado River. Hoover Dam was the most ambitious and technically challenging engineering project of its day. It certainly was the greatest challenge in its time and still holds up as one of the greatest challenges in, in the history of, of modern technology. The workforce were ruthlessly exploited. They endured appalling living conditions, extreme temperatures and poisonous fumes. 112 of them died. To build this groundbreaking structure was an extraordinary feat, requiring daring, bravery, and the vision to push the boundaries of engineering. The prospect of constructing a dam on the Colorado River, the technological challenges, there were some who said it couldn't be done. Dam construction is notoriously difficult and dangerous. The risks involved are huge. And if a dam fails, the consequences could be catastrophic. Hoover Dam measures 221 meters high and is 201 meters thick at its base. In total, it comprises about 3.4 million cubic meters of concrete. Running through the American Southwest, the Colorado is one of the world's most powerful and unpredictable rivers. Every spring, it would break its banks, causing massive floods. The result, widespread flooding that destroyed crops and the livelihoods of thousands. The government instructed engineers at the Bureau of Reclamation to come up with a solution. The boys at the Bureau decided to build a dam. Not just any dam, but the biggest one ever built. This super dam would not only control the flooding, it would also harness the enormous power of the Colorado River to provide electricity for thousands of homes. And the site the engineers chose was Black Canyon, an 800 feet deep gorge carved out by the river. Black Canyon lay in the heart of the desert. There was no local workforce, no infrastructure, and no direct transport links. It would be hard to imagine a more desolate spot for one of the world's most ambitious engineering projects. But there were two things in its favor. 30 miles away, the railroad ran through a small outpost called Las Vegas, now the gambling capital of the world. The Vegas Railroad would act as a vital supply line. And immediately upriver lay a vast plain that would be an ideal location for America's largest reservoir. This place was isolated, and yet somebody comes along and says, we're going to build the biggest dam in the world there. What an ego. <laughs> that ego belonged to Chief Engineer Frank Crow. Crow had carved out a reputation as a gifted dam builder, but a project on this scale was his lifelong ambition. As a result, he was determined to get the job done, at any cost. Crow quit his job to be more involved on site, where he drove the workforce relentlessly. The timing of Hoover Dam suited Crow's ruthless methods down to the ground. Its construction would span the years 1931 to 35, the height of America's Great Depression when a quarter of the workforce were desperate for a job. Hoover Dam was welcomed as a way to get many of them back to work. 
people were desperate to feed themselves and their families. There wasn't much work. Hoover Dam was the mecca. As news of the project spread, thousands of hopeful workers and their families flocked to the desert lands around Black Canyon. Within three weeks of the project's announcement, the local employment office received 12,000 applications for work. The construction company had a ready-made workforce of desperate men, and they were not slow to exploit them. These men were hostages. There were thousands waiting to take their job. They would put up with it. They'd take the risk. A punishing schedule lay ahead of the workers. The dam had to be finished in just seven years and cost no more than $125,392,000, nearly 788 million pounds in today's money. What's more, if Frank Crow and his team failed to complete on time and budget, it would cost the company a massive $3,000 a day in financial penalties. The pressure was on. In April 1931, construction began. The inexperienced workforce began blasting tunnels through the solid rock walls of the canyon. Stage one was to create an area of dry riverbed upon which the dam would be built. To do this, the Colorado had to be diverted away from the construction site. The men must excavate four tunnels, two on each side of the canyon, each measuring some 4,000 feet long. These would act as diversion channels for the river, while two temporary, or coffer dams, would prevent the water from taking its natural course. But this technique had never been attempted on such a monumental scale. There was no room for mistakes. These tunnels would have to handle the full force of one of America's most powerful rivers. A current of approximately 850 cubic meters of water per second. People would have probably looked at them and said they were just absolutely bonkers to try to even think to build out here. To add to the problems, the summer of 1931 proved to be one of the hottest on record. By July, temperatures had risen to a blistering 49 degrees Celsius, taking a vicious toll on the workers. The workers themselves, who had never seen anything like this before, who had never encountered heat like this before, becoming dehydrated, were dealing with heat prostration. And so that first year, there was tremendous loss of life. The historic project was underway, but further progress would come at an enormous cost. When it was completed in 1935, the Hoover Dam would become the tallest, largest and heaviest dam in the world. A structure on this scale had never been attempted in such a challenging environment. It immediately dwarfed one of Chief Engineer Frank Crow's earlier projects, the Ararat Dam in Idaho. At 106 meters high, Ararat was the tallest dam in the world, but it was half the height of Hoover and a third of its width. But from the very beginning, building on this unprecedented scale posed enormous technical challenges and required extraordinary feats of human endurance. By May 1931, the workforce at Hoover Dam were drilling their way through the solid rock walls of Black Canyon. The aim? To create four tunnels to divert the course of the mighty Colorado River. With only seven years to complete the project, Frank Crow devised a rigid schedule and pushed the men to the limit. Work went on around the clock, seven days a week. The men got only three days off a year, Christmas, the 4th of July and Labor Day. All were unpaid. Crow's relentless drive earned him the nickname Hurry Up Crow. But his genius was to identify where working practices could be improved. One such area was excavating rock inside the diversion tunnels. Traditionally, a line of men would drill powder holes into the rock with pneumatic drills, then pack the holes with dynamite and blast away the weak layers of rock. It was slow, back-breaking work. Crow revolutionized the process by introducing the drilling jumbo, a customized 10-ton truck from which 50 men and 24 to 30 drills could work simultaneously. They backed the truck up to the tunnel face and drilled half of it in one go. 
Eight drilling jumbos were constructed for use on site. 500 drills, hoses and compressors were brought in and tunneling progressed at a record-breaking pace. But to get the job done, Crow blatantly sacrificed safety for speed and the lives of the men were placed in grave danger. During summer, temperatures inside the tunnels rose to a dangerous 60 degrees Celsius. Teams known as ice brigades were on standby to plunge the exhausted men into baths of icy water. Despite their efforts, 14 died from heat exhaustion. The lives of the men were also endangered by the lack of ventilation in the tunnels. Deadly carbon monoxide fumes from the constant traffic of petrol vehicles built up, poisoning the workforce. And those gases were building up exceedingly high in the tunnels. And the worker says, we're dying of carbon monoxide poisoning. They said the air was blue. The company says, it's not that bad. As a direct result, dozens of workers were hospitalized, suffering from headaches, vomiting, and dizziness. Frank Crow essentially did what he felt he had to do. He got the job done, and people suffered for it. He not only pushed the boundary, sometimes he exceeded it. While the tunneling continued, work was going on higher up in the canyon. The men here were known as high scalers, and of all the jobs on the project, theirs was the most dangerous. The work was extremely physically demanding, the men had to swing hundreds of feet down canyon walls to remove hazardous loose rock using jackhammers and dynamite. With no modern safety measures, the men required nerves of steel. The danger of falling rock and other objects meant that the high scalers diced with death every day. The most common cause of death on site was being hit by falling objects. Because of the extreme danger they faced, the high scalers were paid 40% more than other construction workers. The daredevil stunts they performed drew crowds of fascinated onlookers from Las Vegas. In fact, many of the men had been circus performers before working at the dam. Despite these obstacles, on November the 14th, 1932, the four diversion tunnels were completed. The excavated rock was dumped in the path of the Colorado River, both upstream and down, to create two temporary coffer dams to block the natural course of the river and force it through the tunnels. For the first time in history, man had altered the path of the mighty Colorado River. Frank Crow's rigorous regime had paid off. Phase one of the construction had taken just 18 months and was finished 10 months ahead of schedule. Crow had ruthlessly driven his men and risked their lives, but he'd shown the way for the future of dam building. Hoover Dam would have been inconceivable without one simple ingredient, concrete. Concrete had been used to build dams for over 50 years, but Hoover Dam was the first to use it on such an unprecedented scale. One of the earliest examples of a concrete dam is the Lower Crystal Springs Dam in San Mateo, 15 miles south of San Francisco. When it was built in 1888, it was the largest dam of its kind. It measures 47 meters high and 183 meters wide and holds back a massive 85,550 cubic meters of water. In the late 1800s, its purpose was to provide San Francisco, one of America's fastest growing cities, with a reliable and sustainable water supply. But the engineers who built it were taking a serious gamble. It was one of the first structures of its size to be built entirely of concrete. And with concrete came problems. One of the most difficult things involved in building a dam of this size out of concrete was finding the right types of material. There was no source of uh, cement, in the, at least in those volumes, on the western United States coastline, so they had to bring it from England around Cape Horn. Even getting enough sand to mix with the cement was a problem. 175,000 tons had to be scooped from the beaches of San Francisco and dragged 25 miles to the construction site. 
by horse and cart. Lower Crystal Springs Dam was the brainchild of an ambitious German engineer called Hermann Schussler. Once the ingredients were assembled, Schussler realized that the only feasible way to build his dam was in a series of concrete blocks, which gave him another problem. To build in blocks created numerous lines of weakness within the dam structure. The immense weight of water bearing down on it would find and expose those weaknesses and ultimately destroy the dam. So Schussler designed an intricate network of interlocking blocks and glued them together with concrete. It was like an ingenious three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. The innovative technique worked. It made Lower Crystal Springs Dam stronger than any previous design. And it had to be. Running down the middle of the reservoir, just 400 feet from the dam, is the San Andreas Fault. The San Andreas Earthquake Fault runs through the state of California and is responsible for two major earthquakes in San Francisco in the last hundred years. In 1906 and 1989, earthquakes measuring up to 7.1 on the Richter scale collapsed bridges, houses, and ripped freeways apart. But the Lower Crystal Springs Dam survived both, and astonishingly, it remains as structurally sound as the day it was built more than you can say for the roadway. There are much larger dams than the Lower Crystal Springs Dam, but something small can be great also. So I think this is an out, just an outstanding example of, of engineering brilliance, and I think it's one of the greatest dams ever built. Lower Crystal Springs set new standards for dam design and construction, and directly influenced the building of Hoover Dam. Only Hoover would do it bigger and better. By November 1932, Phase one of the construction of Hoover Dam was complete. Chief Engineer Frank Crow and his workforce could now focus on building the dam itself. But the sheer scale of the structure they designed posed a number of engineering problems that had to be solved. Hoover is an arch gravity dam, a design that incorporates two basic engineering principles. Firstly, the sheer weight of concrete forces the structure into the ground. Secondly, the arch shape deflects the pressure of the water, building up behind it into the canyon walls. But the design posed a serious challenge. It would require an unprecedented volume of concrete. A total of 3.4 million cubic meters of concrete was required, enough to build a road nearly three times the length of Britain. To meet this demand, two huge concrete manufacturing plants were built at the construction site. Frank Crow's next worry was that his dam was too big to be made in a single concrete mold. If it had been, the concrete would still be setting today. When the ingredients of concrete, cement, aggregate and water are combined, they trigger a chemical reaction. This reaction generates internal heat and slows down the curing process, the time it takes to set hard. The larger the pore, the longer the cure. If the heat is not dispersed, cracks will form, weakening the structure. So following the example of Schussler and Lower Crystal Springs Dam, Crow decided to build Hoover from a series of interlocking blocks. But it wasn't that simple. Crow's dam would be 20 times the mass of Schussler's. Using interlocking blocks on such a vast scale had never been attempted before. Each block stood five feet high, but varied in depth and length. The largest was 25 feet by 60 feet. The sides of each block were scored with vertical grooves that interlocked with its neighbor. When each block had set, mortar was forced between the joints, making the structure even stronger. To accelerate the setting process, Crow also designed an intricate system of pipes buried in the concrete. By pumping cold water through the pipes, the concrete mix was cooled and cured faster. Next, Crow faced a battle with the desert sun. The effect of this external heat meant that the concrete began drying out before it was in position. Crow needed a solution, fast. To speed up delivery of the concrete, he designed an elaborate network of overhead cables and pulleys. Cables slung across the canyon directly above the construction site carried vast buckets of concrete that were pulleyed down to teams waiting to pour. 
When coordinated with the aggregate plant's endless supply of concrete, a well-oiled production line was created. To speed up the process even more, Crow encouraged rivalry between the teams of men. It worked. On one day, they poured a staggering 8,000 cubic meters of concrete. To keep on schedule, the construction crews had to toil night and day, year in, year out, pouring interlocking block after interlocking block. As the grueling schedule took its toll on the men, their families faced a battle of their own, simply to survive. With no permanent housing, they were forced to camp in the desert. Conditions were appallingly squalid. Workers and their families lived in tents, draped with wet sheets, the only way to gain some relief from the stifling heat. With little fresh water available and no refrigeration to keep food from spoiling, hundreds faced a daily struggle to fight off disease and starvation. Not having water, not having sanitation facilities, having to bathe in the river. As it got hotter and hotter, people got sicker and sicker. And then they began to die. Not only were the workers dying, but their families were dying. Living conditions for the workers of Hoover Dam became so bad that the construction company had to act. They began building a new town to house them, with the same urgency as the dam itself. Within six months of starting, enough basic accommodation was erected to house 658 families. Boulder City was designed as a clean living company town, complete with family homes, mess halls, churches and entertainment. But the workers paid dearly for their improved lifestyle. 25 cents in every dollar earned was held back from their weekly wages in lieu of rent and paid straight back into company coffers. The example of Boulder City, built for the workers of Hoover Dam, inspired the creation of another workers' community in the 1930s. Mason City was created to house the workforce of America's next super dam project, the Grand Coulee Dam. The Grand Coulee Dam stands in the part of the Columbia River in Washington State. This is the largest concrete structure in the United States, and it owes much to its predecessor, the Hoover Dam. Grand Coulee was to take many of the lessons learned from Hoover and supersize them. And many of the men who actually built Hoover Dam uh, moved on to Grand Coulee, and they took with them their experience, they took with them their knowledge. And as they worked on Grand Coulee Dam, they put all of that to use, and that was important in the construction of that particular structure as well. The dam is 60 meters taller than St. Paul's Cathedral and stretches one mile wide. It contains a massive 9.2 million cubic meters of concrete, nearly three times that used in Hoover Dam, enough to build a pavement twice around the equator. Work on the dam began in July 1933, two years before the Hoover Dam was finished, and there were tough challenges from the very beginning. Like Hoover, the biggest problems involved pouring concrete. But while workers at Hoover Dam battled with heat, in Washington state, the workers faced winter temperatures well below freezing. The bitter cold could freeze and crack the concrete. Once again, the solution was provided by lessons learned at Hoover Dam. 2,000 miles of pipes were embedded in the concrete blocks during construction of Grand Coulee. As temperatures plummeted during the winter months, hot water was circulated through the pipes to artificially warm the concrete. In the summer months, cool water provided the opposite effect. The sheer scale of Grand Coulee was another major headache. The huge excavation for the dam put the site and workforce at risk from landslides. In order to stabilize the area, engineers came up with a highly imaginative solution to hold back any further landslides. They decided to create a dam 100 feet long and 40 feet high from frozen mud. Six miles of pipes were driven into the hillside and supercooled salt brine was pumped through. This froze the surrounding earth 
protecting the workers below. Grand Coulee Dam was eventually completed in 1941, just in time for the United States' entry into the Second World War. The dam became a vital hydroelectric power supply for the ship and aircraft building industries in the Pacific Northwest. It also supplied electricity to the Hanford Nuclear Reservation that provided uranium and plutonium for the first nuclear bombs. The Grand Coulee Dam soon became the largest hydroelectric plant in North America. Even today, it remains the fourth largest in the world, generating a massive 6.5 million kilowatts of electricity per year. These generators rate among the largest in the world. Just a single one is capable of powering the city of Portland, Oregon. But the soaring ambition of Grand Coulee Dam would not have been possible without the example of Hoover Dam. By 1934, construction of Hoover Dam was well underway. The course of the Colorado River had been diverted, and the vast workforce had labored 24-7 to create the dam wall. At last, Frank Crow's dream was taking shape. By the 31st of January the following year, the arch dam wall was complete. Crow had pushed his men ruthlessly, and 3.4 million cubic meters of concrete was now setting as a massive, gleaming edifice plucking Black Canyon. For over two years, the Colorado River had been forced from its natural course and diverted through four tunnels. The huge steel bulkhead gates were lowered, closing off the tunnels, allowing the river to slowly pool behind the dam. This was the moment of truth. Crow and his men watched as the pressure on their dam gradually increased. At its base, the weight of water would eventually be equal to five elephants standing on your head. Any major weaknesses in the structure would quickly be exposed. Dams such as Hoover showed what engineers were capable of achieving. But when miscalculations occur, disaster can strike with terrifying consequences. In June 1976, the Teton Dam in Idaho dramatically failed when its reservoir was first filled. On the morning of June the 5th, the pressure of water building behind the dam proved to be too powerful, and a major leak developed in the structure. Bulldozers were immediately deployed to plug the enlarging hole. Then a new leak appeared, and in desperation, the alarm was raised. Within an hour, the inevitable happened. The entire dam collapsed, and a six feet high wall of water smashed the town of Rexburg. 80 billion gallons swept houses and trees away until the whole town was submerged. By evening, the reservoir had completely emptied. The disaster killed 11 people and cost nearly $1 billion. But as the waters of the Colorado River rose behind the Hoover Dam, the structure stood firm. It was now clear that Crow and his engineers over-anticipated the force of the river. The weight of the concrete alone would have been enough to hold back the Colorado. As Lake Mead gradually formed, work at Hoover Dam continued on the two powerhouses. One on the Nevada side, the other in Arizona. Together they housed 17 generators, each one capable of supplying enough electricity to power 100,000 homes. When complete, the dam would produce as much energy as two nuclear power stations. Hydroelectric power is produced when the reservoir water flows into the intake towers. Here, the water falls through a tunnel, or penstock, inside the dam. At the end of the penstock, the water hits and turns a turbine propeller, which drives the generator. This spins a series of magnets inside coils of copper wire, producing electricity. Power lines then carry the electricity from the generator to a substation. Meanwhile, the water continues past the turbine propeller and empties into the river downstream. On September the 30th, 1935, President Roosevelt inaugurated Hoover Dam. Thousands made the journey into the desert to witness the historic event. 
A month later, the first generator was in full operation, swiftly followed by the second and third. By 1939, all were up and running with a capacity of 704,800 kilowatts, making Hoover Dam the world's largest hydroelectric plant. A crown passed to Grand Coulee a decade later. The massive surge in electric power transformed the American Southwest. 56% was destined for Los Angeles and Southern California. Las Vegas and Phoenix became the fastest growing cities in the US. Lake Mead, the source for Hoover's immense power reserves, is the largest reservoir in America at 500 feet deep and 110 miles long. This enormous lake took a full six years to form. It's so vast that as it filled, the weight of its water actually triggered a series of mini earthquakes. The combined weight of the reservoir and dam was 41 billion tons, enough to create a seven inch depression in the Earth's surface. Today, over eight million people flock to Lake Mead every year, but few are aware of what lies beneath the surface of the water. Over 70 years ago, when the reservoir began to fill, it flooded much of Hoover Dam's construction site. With water levels at an all-time low, the National Park's diving team has discovered the remains of one of the 20th century's most famous building sites. In the murky water lies the dam's gravel plant. This site would sort aggregate by size and supply 1,000 tons of material every hour for the concrete mix. And there was another unexpected find in its gloomy depths. This B-29 bomber crashed into Lake Mead in 1948 in a freak accident. The aircraft was badly damaged on impact and disappeared beneath the surface, not to be seen again for over 50 years. With Hoover Dam complete, the mighty Colorado River was tamed, and the desert of the American Southwest transformed into fertile, productive farmland. But the impact of super dams on their environment is profound and highly controversial. 25 years after Hoover was built, Another dam in Egypt would create an oasis in the desert, but this time at an unexpected cost. By the early 1950s, the Egyptian government found themselves facing a similar challenge to the US Bureau of Reclamation. They needed to control the floodwaters of the world's longest river, and to solve the problem, they built one of the most famous dams in the world. The Aswan High Dam lies in southern Egypt. 111 miles south of the historic city of Luxor. Building this dam was an epic undertaking. It contains enough material to build the Great Pyramid of Giza 17 times. Aswan High Dam measures 114 meters high and is over two miles long. It is an embankment dam built of earth and rock filled with a core of clay and concrete. Egypt is one of the driest and hottest countries on the planet, but it has one huge resource running its entire length, the River Nile. Every summer, the Nile would break its banks, depositing layers of fertile silt in the surrounding desert. It was good news for farmers. But the flooding was unpredictable, and if it failed, widespread drought and misery would devastate the riverside population. The Aswan High Dam was designed to capture this floodwater during rainy seasons and release it during times of drought. Work started on the Aswan High Dam in 1960, but was hampered by faulty Soviet equipment. The machinery was designed to work in conditions more suited to Siberia and repeatedly failed in the desert heat. Despite these setbacks, by 1964, with construction still continuing, the reservoir, Lake Nasa, began to swell behind the dam walls. But as the waters rose, hundreds of ancient Egyptian monuments were in danger of being destroyed. Archaeologists faced an urgent challenge to save these priceless treasures from the rising waters. Mm. 
The creation of Lake Nasser by the Aswan High Dam threatened to submerge some of Egypt's most valuable ancient monuments forever. A plan to save these sites was immediately put into effect. Archaeologists faced a painstaking task. Each artifact had to be carefully taken apart, stone by stone, and then reassembled on higher ground. A total of 23 major monuments, including the famous Abu Simbel temples, were salvaged and moved to safer locations. Within six years, the new lake stretched as far as the eye could see. The flooding made 90,000 people homeless. Aswan High Dam was completed in 1970 and proved to be an immediate success, increasing the amount of fertile land in Egypt by a staggering 30%. The long-term benefits of Aswan, though, are hotly debated. The rich and fertile silt, once deposited by the yearly flooding, is now held behind the dam. Because of this, the surrounding land has become less fertile, and farmers had to resort to the use of artificial fertilizers for the first time in history. But this now regular and reliable water supply is a lifeline in the desert. The creation of the Aswan High Dam means that for the first time ever, the Egyptian people are no longer at the mercy of their unpredictable river. The Hoover Dam project was completed an incredible two years, one month, and 28 days ahead of schedule. What's more, it came in $15 million under budget. In total, the entire construction cost $125,392,000 the equivalent of nearly 788 million pounds today. For this amazing feat, Frank Crow, the chief engineer, was rewarded with a bonus of $350,000, nearly three million pounds in today's money. No one else that I am aware of at the time was capable of doing what Frank T. Crow could do on this project. And I think we can look at Hoover Dam today. If we think of anybody, we should think of Frank Crow and remember him because he made it a reality. But what amazed the world in 1935, when it was inaugurated, was the implausibility of this extraordinary feat of engineering. Even today, nearly one million visitors a year make the pilgrimage into the Mojave Desert to wonder at the sheer scale and beauty of the dam. The engineers knew they were doing something extraordinary, so they built Hoover Dam with tourists in mind. No other dam is so intricately designed. The Art Deco style gives its enormous bulk and elegance and grace that has never been surpassed. But one rumor about the dam's amazing construction refuses to die. Many still believe that the bodies of workers remain buried in the concrete. Although 112 men gave their lives building this incredible edifice, not a single one was entombed in the structure, and their memory is honored to this day. Seven miles of inspection tunnels crisscross the interior of the dam. These were installed so that the integrity of the concrete could be routinely monitored. But today, 70 years later, there is no longer any need to check whether the structure is sound. The skill and dedication of the workforce ensured that Hoover Dam could survive almost indefinitely. Concrete tends to cure forever. Structurally, Hoover Dam is stronger today than the day it was completed. Hoover Dam was the first super dam. It revolutionized dam building throughout the world. It enabled and inspired the next generation of super dams to be broader, taller, and more productive. Hoover set the benchmark all dams would be tested against. From then on, when people said, how do you do it right? You say you do it like Hoover Dam. We know that the specifications that were used for Hoover Dam are used by countries around the world, and I think that standard makes it the greatest dam that was ever built. Its remarkable legacy 
means that Hoover Dam can still stake a claim to be the greatest, most iconic, and famous dam in the world. Next on five, an explosion on board an aircraft that blew a gaping hole in the floor in the dramatic story of tonight's air crash investigation after a five news update.